Hi, everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Beatles News Briefs. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci. On show 51, Beatle News author and contributing editor Candy Leonard and myself talked about some personal memories of the week America discovered the Beatles. Here's part two of that discussion based in large part on Candy's 2015 article on Huffington Post titled The Seven Ways the Beatles Changed Boomer Childhood Overnight. When I look back on it, and again, I think about the people I've interviewed and my own reflecting on it. I mean, I, I, it was something really extraordinary. And I, like many people, feel very um, lucky <laughs> to have witnessed it and to, um, you know, have those memories that are that are so powerful. And, you know, you were saying how you, you remember where everybody was sitting in the room. Mm-hmm. I guess, not unusual. The fans that I interviewed remembered where they were sitting, who was on the Naugahyde footstool. We had just come out of a shower, you know, Sunday night. We always had to take showers. I washed my hair was wet. Like this, this level of detail because the, in, in our, you know, when, when we remember details like that, it's because we, we, we file it away in memory in, in a way because in, in, differently than events that are not exciting in that way. In other words, we we filed it in long term memory with the detail because we were so aroused. Mm-hmm. You know? And the result of this whole week is uh, you and you met, you talk about it kind of in the in the uh, Huffington Post article. The Beatles made music a necessity. Yeah, which is which is, which is absolutely true because uh, for me personally, music wasn't that big of a deal before, but it did it became a big deal afterwards. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, it's funny. Like I, I'm sure that I was listening to music, and I started to say before I, I I learned later that my mother was a huge like my mother used to listen to like top forty on WABC. I realized later because I found like some like list of songs and some material that she had gotten from them. But anyway, so I had music in my life, but you know I think for most kids, you know it was like Disney records, you know Alvin and the Chipmunks or. You know, and and then suddenly it's I want to hold your hand, and it was music that was well, it was much cooler than the other stuff, but it was <laughs> it was for us. It was it was something. It was like you know this thing that came, and and it you you felt this sense of ownership because you knew as a kid that this was something. It sort of put you in this community of people who loved this, right? Right. And well, so there was this big social dimension to it. Mm-hmm. You're, in fact, that's your second point. Uh, in the article, it said the Beatles displaced traditional childhood pastimes. Which, Absolutely. Which, I mean, which, I, yeah. I think that's especially true for boys, perhaps even more than girls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what I say is, you know, cowboys, in, cowboys and Indians, Lincoln Logs, sports. You know, were all suddenly replaced with playing Beatles with tennis rackets and guitars, yeah, as guitars, or or again sitting or you know like listening and being glued to your radio, um, waiting for the next song. And you know, so so you you suddenly you seem I, for me like I feel like it like kickstarted my participation in the culture in a way that I don't think at age seven, I otherwise would have been, you know, that yeah. was like it initiated my involvement in the world. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, for, uh, it probably was more true for you than for me. Cause I was, I was a little older, but yeah. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I went out, uh, you know, uh, it, I do remember standing around listening to tr- my transistor radio. You know, we all used to have our ears on it because yeah. we wanted to hear what, you know, what Beatles songs were coming on. So uh, the the next point in your article said the young and, and this one is, is kind of interesting. And let's talk about this is the younger Beatles fans started routinely hanging out with older kids. Right. I mean, prior to this, you'd have your friends, your brother or sister would have their friends, the neighbor next door, maybe who was a little older, you know, you didn't hang out with them. But suddenly, everybody is sharing this experience, right? And so if you like the Beatles, the cool kids, the older kids let you hang out with them. 
you know, so you have these mixed age groups. And then as the Beatles, uh, you know, as the lyrics advanced and as, but even before then, when all the other great pop music that followed in their wake, you're listening to this suddenly, you know, in a group of kids in somebody's basement or on a playground. And, you know, you might have kids ranging from age to like, from seven all the way up to high schoolers. And so younger people were exposed to things, ideas, and, and conversation that they never would have been before. You know? I, I, have to, I have to disagree with you slightly on that one, okay. because I think in my case, at least, I, again, I was, you know, I'm a little older. We may have accepted, we may have talked to younger kids. I mean, I had a younger sister, I had a younger sister and a younger brother at that point. And we may have talked to them, but I don't think we accepted them into our group. They had their own group. You know, they had their own friends and we had our, you know, we had our friends. Right. But when it came to when it was time to, you know, listen to the new record or talk about them. Well, again, like everybody. Well, that, that, that and that part, but, that part would be true because, right, as a matter of you know, the, the beetling and the joy of just talking about them, looking at them. How do they look? How do they sound? Um that part was was done in mixed age group yes people might go off with their own friends after but the sharing of the beatles was very much a um you know at least in the experience in mine and and with the fans that i talked to that it was something that it it brought into your social circle in a way if you were part of this club you know you okay were part of this gang um, and the other, you know, like years, I think with adult siblings, that's, it's still something that resonates. Like, even though, you know, people get older and, you know, families, you know, siblings don't always stay friends throughout their lives and, you know, things change, but the Beatles still are this kind of touchstone that adult siblings can still share and talk about. Mm -hmm. And and that did happen, you know, with, with, in my family, because my sister and I both went, my mother took both my sister and I to a nearby department store, and she bought the albums and I bought the singles. Wow, so, yeah, right. So, right. And, yeah. We, and we both did, and we did that together. I mean, we were both Beatle fans. Actually, she was, she was a a a, a big fan uh, then, and she also was the one that later got into the monkeys a little sooner than I did. You know. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, it was something that, you know, you describe your mother getting you the record. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people have stories like that where, and it's usually the mother, not the, although later fathers got more into it. But yes, it, it was like, it was, they be, they were like a presence in your family. Mm -hmm. you know? They com they commanded attention of, in a way that nothing else did. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it and I mean, in, in my case, like my parents kind of liked them mostly. Um, so, you know, but in a lot of families, as we were talking before, it was not the case. And, you know, some kids were, you know, they were not permitted to listen to them and watch them. You know, they were seen as subversive or, right. you know, a, a commu you know, a tool of the communists. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I, I remember that talk from those days. Fortunately, that didn't prevail in, in my house, fortunately. But then the next part uh, in your in your uh, piece said children became aware of their appearance and wanted to look cool. Now, in my case, that was kind of tough to do because I was in a Catholic parochial school and they, you know, they told there was you. There's no way you were going to look cool. <laughs> no, 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 no. So uh, that that didn't happen with me. So did you but, have to wear a uniform? Yes. Yes, uh -huh. we did. Yeah, we did tie, uh, white shirt and tie, as I recall. Uh, didn't have to wear a coat or I don't think we didn't have to wear a coat, but I believe it was a white shirt and a tie or I think so. Yeah, I think it was a white shirt and tie and, and the girls had to wear uniforms. So um, suddenly young kids like, you know, like there was suddenly like looking cool became so important, you know, because the Beatles were so cool. And right. so, and, you be, and you know, so boys didn't want to get their hair cut anymore. You yeah. Know? Well, and that's not, that's not to say outside of school you couldn't try to do stuff. You know, right. if you if you got your if you got your folks uh, to get you beetle boots, which didn't happen with me, I couldn't wear them anyway. But I mean, if you got to them to wear, if you got beetle boots or you got a, you know, a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or something like that, 
well, yeah, there you go. You know, you, you were, right. cool. You were cool. Right. You uh, wanted to somehow communicate to your peer group and everybody that, that you were part of this thing. Right. You know, whether it was through hair or through T-shirts or, uh, you know, shortly after, you know, for, with sort of style of clothing. I mean, for girls, you know, growing the hair didn't obviously have the same impact. But, you know, girls became very interested in the even young girls. I mean, I can mm-hmm. remember I was seven, eight years old, you know, Patty, Cynthia, Jane, Maureen. You know, there were like these four females that were somehow attached to them. Right. You know, and, you know, with their long blonde hair and their eyes of blue and and their, um, you know, the mini skirts and all this. It, it was it became like, I don't know, I have a very vivid memory of sitting in a, we used to have assembly every Friday afternoon. And while we didn't have uniforms, it was public school. On Fridays, you had to wear, everybody had to wear a white shirt. And the boys had to wear red ties. And the girls usually wore like a red kerchief or a red scarf. Well, we all started after a hard day's night, certainly wearing boys ties, you know, red ties. <laughs> <laughs> wow and, yeah and i can remember also we you know used to have to sing the assembly was like the, really fun and we so we used to sing songs and i can remember my friends and i making up um alternative lyrics that brought the beatles in in some way you know uh, like that somehow we ended up in our own little way singing about them it was an, it was an obsession i mean it was on the notebooks on the did they did they let you continue wearing the ties they didn't care. I mean, yeah, that that wasn't an issue at all, as I recall. No, because <laughs> you know, we were. You know, I think parents and adults kind of indulge this to a point. You know that that um, you know some aspect, aspects of it was harmless, and it, you know it may also be that they liked our enthusiasm. I mean, adults want kids to be happy until unless they see it becoming a problem. You know? Right. If so, you were if you were really lucky, if you were really lucky your parents let you take music lessons. Right. And in my case, they did. However, my timing was really bad because we started taking music lessons before the Beatles came along. My sister started playing piano, which I really wish I had picked. We had our choice of picking any instrument we wanted. And I'm almost afraid to, I'm almost embarrassed to to admit this. I didn't pick piano. I didn't pick guitar. I picked accordion. Well, you know. I do not have an accordion now and I, I do not play it anymore. But I did. And I even played, I even think I played Lady of Spain at one time. Isn't that the song that one learns on the, yes. Or, yes. that and polk, polkas, right? Something like that. Yeah, polkas. I, so, I, I, yeah. I, I think I do remember getting a Beatles uh, a songbook after the Beatles started, but playing Beatles songs on accordion just doesn't make it. But well, now it might be considered sort of interesting, but certainly right. at the time it was it was not cool, Steve. No, it was not. It was not. It was not. That was not cool. That was not cool. Okay, next, next. Uh, let's see. They displaced tr- traditional. Male role models, absolutely. Yeah, Abs- absolutely. soldiers, athletes, you know, suddenly were less appealing, less interesting than these four musicians. The, the uh, softer masculinity, I think, was... And, and in all... Appealing, but it was interesting, you know, it was different. It was part of what was different, you know, and the fun around them, too. That even then, again, at that time, the perception of people at that time, which is kind of hard to capture, but I mean, you, you know, I mean, we were talking before, all anybody commented on was the hair. They look like girls, you know, so quite the word, but they were, and, you know, it's been referred to as androgynous, it's probably more accurate than, than feminine, effeminate, but, you know, they were wearing uh, very styled European suits. The hair was long for the moment, styled, um, and they were not, uh, you know, they, they were, there was no macho about them in any way, you know, no, they, were, that, they were fun. They were just these fun guys, you know. That's, that's absolutely true. They were not, they were, they were, you know, they were regular guys. Right. Um, and they had this kind of charisma that we really hadn't quite seen before, you know, a style and attitude that was completely new. Mm-hmm. Your your next point: Children became consumers when they became fans of the Beatles. Well, that's absolutely true because you'd buy everything 
that you could. Right. It was really, I mean, we were, they were sold to us in a very, very big way. Right. Right. Um, And I I often say that, uh, you know, there's this organization that I think is wonderful called Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, which, of course, today means something. They're actually very effective in getting Disney and, and other companies to stop making products for kids that they feel are harmful. But what's interesting is that we, our generation, was was really the first demographic identified as a market in that way. These are there's 73 million baby boomers and and again we're talking primarily white middle class and there was money enough discretionary money to spend on beetle merchandise and so when you the first for many fans you know they remember that the first time they were allowed to go to the store by themselves was to buy a beetle magazine or a pack of cards or a record so they really so like we became consumers like okay Hattie I'm getting an allowance or I'm doing chores you know do I save it do I spend it if I save it I can get the next record so you sort of started to think about somebody who buys stuff which which was a new thing yeah. Mm-hmm. And you wanted to, uh, I remember going to the store and buying, you know, packs of Beetle cards oh. like crazy. That's, I mean, I could, I could afford that. Right. And that gum that was inside, you know, oh, was, right. yes. and which, ones were the, which pictures were you going to get? And the other thing about the cards, and this ties in with so many of the fans being young, is that when you're seven, eight, nine, ten years old, you're very into collecting and sorting, you know, it's sort of that comes with that age of development and so the cards were perfect because you could trade them collect them you know sort them into four piles you know they they were just you know stick them in the spokes of your bike you know all the it was just it was like another way to have them with you during the day right Right. Yeah, they were. They I mean, were. we wanted them. I mean, like any excuse to talk about them. Like I can remember in elementary school, if there was discussion about England would come up mm-hmm. or anything, it was like it. It was immediately about the Beatles. Yeah. You know? I mean, it be it was. So, I mean, to say it was an obsession or a focal point, I I don't. You know, it, it's very difficult to describe. And you know, that was one of my the challenges I set for myself in in Beatleness was to really capture that um you know that sense of suddenly there's this other presence in my life that brings me so much joy Mm -hmm. and then the last point is that beatlemania created global and generational consciousness in young boomers and that 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 is absolutely true too because well they embraced the whole world and and it was a it was a boomer thing and so like we knew that this wasn't happening here, you know, we, you know, because we got into reading the newspaper because we wanted to find articles about them and cut them out and save them. And, and so we knew that they were traveling all over the world. And that's why songs like P.S. I Love You and, you know, these early songs were about, you know, missing you. And, and which, of course, they've said that, you know, they, they kind of acknowledge this. It, it fed that narrative of like they're traveling all around the world, but like, you know, we still love you and I want to see you, you know. And um, but also, you know, the, the songs in German, right, which was kind of weird at the time in a way. Mm-hmm. But it also let us know, you know, it was more proof that this was something happening all over the world. Yeah. Right. And I think so- it, uh, I think in another respect, though, I think at the beginning um, and I don't know if you remember it as well as I do, but, you know, adults kind of look down on our generation um, at that point. And I think the Beatles kind of raised the respect a, a, just a little bit, not a not a whole lot. But I I'm mean, sure what just, you mean about look down on because that certainly happened later in the decade. Mm-hmm. I'm not- uh, there was a an establishment thing that with the Beatles kind of came up against in the beginning, and it and the uh, later on I think the the establishment was more accepting of them. Well, the, right. Was- well, I think I mean I I, I, admit it, I think that um, just the whole uh, the hierarchy of adults and kids was so much more rigid than than we can even you know than it is now and than it's been since the 60s so i'm not sure if this is what you mean but like certainly 
kids were like seen and not heard, you know, and even right. teenagers were, were, you know, there was, kids had no power at all, you right. know, and, and even parenting styles then were just beginning to be a little more democratic, but for the most part, kids had no say in anything, right. you know, so, you know, and, and they um, changed that. They did. They absolutely, they absolutely, you know, absolutely and did. the and the way they empowered us to rebel, whether it was the hair or the skirt or, uh, you know, early on and more things later on. Um, that's one of the reasons I think we love them so much is because they empowered us to be ourselves and to, um, you know, not, you know, to think for ourselves and 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 we were all in this together. So there was this, you know, this generational consciousness. But they they really did make us feel powerful. I, I met a woman a couple of years ago who grew up in Mexico, and she remembers when the Beatles. It was around the same time that she learned about the Beatles. She's you know like in our age group, and her recollection, the way she described it was, they gave us permission. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I thought that's very interesting, especially, you know, this is not not a native speaker of English, you know. And so it, it was it was a global thing where all these young people suddenly felt they had permission. And so as a result of this, by 1968, you see young people all over the world, um, you know, saying we need to do things differently. Thank you, Candy. Just a little bit of Beatles news with some UK chart positions from officialcharts.com for February 14th. From the album Top 100, Beatles 1 is number 86, up from 89. And on the vinyl chart, at number 30, up from 31, is Sgt. Pepper. On this day in history, uh, on February 11th, 1963, the Beatles recorded their first album, Please Please Me, in a 10-hour session. And on February 11, 1964, the Beatles played the Washington Coliseum. They had originally planned to take a flight to Washington, but the flight was canceled due to bad weather. It's great being here in New York. Okay. Oh, is that the place? I don't know. Washington. I'm just moving so fast. They played in the round in a format that required Ringo's drums to be manually turned so he could face different sections of the audience. Later, at an embassy reception, a dignitary snipped a lock of Ringo's hair. That's it for now. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com. Thanks, Matt. beatles Arama. Thanks, Pat. And also on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's also available on YouTube. Please join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world and check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people. And we invite you to join our Beatles Toppermost of the Poppermost message board at abbeyroad.proboards.com. It's also available on the Tap and Talk app. And look for our next show and please subscribe. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying, Be seeing you. that one market fab <laughs> <laughs>